Hello. Last session of the day by John Manzoni. Thank you very much for sticking around. Um, we've got a lovely, another excellent panel, actually. We have, to my immediate left is Peter Batt. He is the Director General for Digital Society, Digitization of the Administration and Information Technology at the Federal Ministry of the Interior, Building and Community from Germany. Um, you will just tell us exactly <laughs> what that looks like. Uh, next is Radhika Chadwick. Uh, she's a strategy partner at EY, um, our knowledge partner, who leads our practices, uh, the EY's practices in central government and uh, digital government. Next is Lucelle uh, Veneros, the first Assistant Secretary, Service Delivery Office, Department of Finance from Australia. Uh, Dax Harkins is Director at NSNI Government Payment Services, the UK agency. Uh, and at the end, Tangli Heng, Director of the Transformation Office of the Public Service Division, Singapore. And they do like to do a lot of public transformation in Singapore. So we'll, we'll, once again, you know the routine, five minutes each and we'll have a chat. Uh, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, to speed things up, I'll just skip some information that you'll read on the slides. I'll be happy to share that information um, any when afterwards if you have any questions about that. As you might know, the German public administration is currently undergoing a fundamental modernization and digitization process. In particular, let me start by emphasizing that unlike other EU member states, we cannot and explicitly don't want to approach digitization of the public administration in a centralized manner or by promoting digital only as Denmark does. The key cornerstone of governance in Germany is federalism. After Second World War, we got this as a present of the Allied forces and it turned out to be beneficial for all. The pyramid shows policy making in Germany and that it involves the federal government which consists of currently 14 federal ministries which are autonomous in their respective functional responsibilities. It also involves 16 federal state governments and about 11,000 municipalities. And municipal or local self-government is guaranteed by our constitution. Our system therefore rules out central management. It relies on consensus building, shared responsibility and coordination instead of instructions. And also now, in the digital age. Digitizing the public administration in Germany thus requires a multi-level approach and a complex communication, coordination and management effort. Suffice it to say here that we are dealing with a truly multi-dimensional project. One, ah, yeah, this is our pension insurance and uh, insurance for uh, unemployment that is self-administered. So it is a rather complex structure. Given the complexity of this task, it is small wonder that we are so far not holding a pool position within the European Digital Economy and Society Index. This is DAISY. Despite or because uh, of its size and economic welfare, Germany occupies only the 14th position. It is very good to have good examples like Estonia and Denmark, for example, that are inspiring and have good ideas, but it is, if you'll pardon the expression, utter nonsense to benchmark Germany against Estonia or Denmark. On the other hand, it's quite clear that size is no excuse for poor performance, as you can see uh, within our peer group, we are not at the top either. This is another aspect of our benchmarking results. And you see the problem is primarily due to penetration issues. We haven't been able to reach all administrative levels or the citizens or businesses for that matter. In view of this brief assessment, we have recently undertaken various steps to give digitization of the public administration in Germany a fresh jumpstart. 
we need legal certainty about that. So here you can see some legal foundations for a successful modern public administration. Most important was the Online Access Act. This is uh, from uh, 2017, and according to this act, all suitable administrative procedures have to be offered also fully online with, uh, uh, until 2022. Not much time for full-fledged digital public administration. Here we are revisiting some of the issues that have been touched upon earlier on today. So I'll click through this. This is cosmic, a correlation between output and expectation that ultimately determines the quality of the outcome. The graph, I think, especially illustrates that by simply exchanging, when you look at the bottom, one resource, like human beings, with another resource, like ICT, you do not achieve too much. To put it bluntly, automated nonsense is still nonsense. So by putting pressure on fast-track digitization, we must avoid losing sight of optimizing processes and still more importantly of our products and customer expectations. I found a very inspiring example, the management of AIDA cruises. Uh, they founded a digital unit and intentionally launched it on a green field in order to challenge the existing business model. That all boils down to people's mindsets. You have to keep in mind that you are not only dealing with legacy systems, but also with legacy people in the sense of the mindset they have. This, of course, leads to the requirement that user centricity and user friendliness must constitute the top priority of our digitization efforts and initiatives. So what we do is uh, offering uh, individual digital solutions for different services. And that is all about connection. We have a joint portal network and no central network, which is logical when you think about our approach. And of course, of course, we have a digitization program that is the content for the infrastructure that is the portal, uh, the uh, joint portal of all administrative levels. Strictly see, uh, speaking, it's a portal compound and uh, the digitization program provides its contents. So, what we do is having in this program all administrative levels partake in the effort that we take. So we have joint working groups on all the levels that you have seen. And what we also do, of course, is complying with the single digital gateway. The European Union has the same approach uh, that we have and it is strictly decentral. And it takes into account that we have the subsidiarity rule, which means that every nation has the right to administer uh, the affairs of its own. So I'll skip over the SDG and come to a conclusion. Uh, and that conclusion says, we are not part of the digital dark ages. Clay Risen of the Washington Post suggested that. We are rather well aware that modern digital developments are about to fundamentally change our societies, industries, and public administrations. And we, as a key location for high technology in Germany, we are particularly dependent on this development. We are well aware that this will challenge traditional federal boundaries and decades-old complex administrative procedures. But no risk, no fun. I think we are on a good and ambitious track. What it takes now is a thorough and patient process of careful implementation and a competent change management is key. On that last note, who is familiar with the Pixar animation movie called Ratatouille? Please, hands up. Oh, enough people, I love that. Uh, so, uh, those who do not, please ask your neighbor about the whole story. 
It's about disruption and innovation. It's about change management. It's about a rat becoming a chef in a kitchen. And there are sympathetic people around. You see them and you get to know them and when they get to know that their chef is in fact a rat, they leave. You see only their feet when they walk away. This must not happen to our governments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Radhika Chadwick yep. from okay. EY. Good afternoon, everybody. Last slot of the day. Uh, so can I start perhaps by acknowledging the amazing location that we are in. This is an incredibly historic building. This is the building where they had the meetings of the suffragettes in 1914. This is where Martin Luther King and Gandhi and Churchill have spoken from this very room, not just this building, but this room. This is also where we had the first meeting of the United Nations General Assembly in 1946. So it's quite extraordinary privilege, I think, to be working in Whitehall in Westminster, but also be in this building discussing some of the biggest challenges that we are going to be facing. So what I'd like to do is really just talk about, spend my five or four minutes and a half talking about some of the key trends that I think um, governments really need to be looking at in service design. The first one I've called design for human purpose outcomes. So if you think about design, I, I think of three levels of sophistication in user design, in, in service design. The first level is designing for your user experience. So I'm a small business and I'd like to apply for a grant. How do I find your form? How do I fill out your form more easily online or through my phone? And this is really the area where I think most government service redesign projects have tackled over the last 10 years. I think the next level of sophistication is thinking about designing for your customer experience. Now, what is it that the customer wants from the end-to-end -end experience? So do I need to fill out the form at all? Can't you just fill it out with information I've already given you through APIs and through permission-based data sharing? And I think this is what you know, quite a few government departments are starting to move towards. So I know HMRC is working um, through the future of tax calculations in this sort of area. DWP is looking at benefits calculations. I think one of the most interesting projects I've seen is something called Homestat, which the New York Department of Homelessness is doing. And they're using this kind of thinking and service redesign to create what I think is the most comprehensive street homelessness outreach program. Very interesting stuff to Google. And then the third level, and this is where I think governments really ought to be aiming their ambition, is designing for the human experience. And this is where innovation tends to happen. This is where designers really understand what is the human psychology, what is the underlying need that the person is trying to fulfill, and then reimagine how that need is served. So as a small business, I'm not filling out a form, I'm not giving you data, I'm getting information at the right time in my business life cycle that helps me the right information at the right time, the right support. Very powerful stuff. And that last point that I just made, I think, raises a very important question. We can't talk about service design in the future without discussing the ethics of nudge theory and behavior modification. So the advances that I think we've all seen, and certainly you know, talked quite a bit about today, in data analytics and in cognitive and behavioral science, means that designers are getting really, really good at understanding people and understanding people's needs. And then that offers the possibility for designing for behavioral change. In fact, one of the most interesting trends I've seen recently in service design is the design of citizen journeys based on data systems like Thunderhead. And this is where you've got a technology system that listens to a customer activity across all channels and all touch points, building up a view of what the citizen is looking for discovering their interests, their context, their behaviors, and then using artificial intelligence to help you understand the real intent and then orchestrate the customer journey across every touch point in real time. It's pretty frightening stuff. I mean, behavioral interventions can nudge people towards better choices, like saving for their pension or walking up the steps instead of taking the lift. In fact, I saw a tiny little bit of behavioral economics in play at lunch when we had a couple of napkins there with a little question on it that said, you know, are you really making the healthiest lunch choices? 
But just because you can nudge people towards different decisions doesn't always mean that you should. I think this is a really complex issue. It's come to the forefront in the aftermath of recent elections. And it highlights, I think, a really important point, which is there's a tendency to think that this is someone else's problem, someone with a higher pay grade. Is, design, you know, is, is a person whose job it is to tackle this. And I think one of the things governments need to make an effort in is making ethics everybody's problem. I think you need to set up far more institutions, like the Office for AI, like the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation, that really look at ethics and service design. And you know, if I'm being bold, I would love to see data ethics and ethics in general um, be a much stronger part of the curriculum in schooling. You know, why not half the curriculum? Because you're going to learn the technical stuff anyway when you start working. The third point I'd like to make is that liquid sectors means that governments must compete. What does this mean? Liquid sectors, so sector boundaries are becoming increasingly irrelevant as your citizen expectation is transferred from one sector to another. So if I'm a customer and I'm placing an order on a website, I don't actually care whether the organization on the other side is a bank or an energy company or a government, I just expect fast, accurate results. And a good experience with my bank sets the standard for me for what I expect from my experience with government. So, so what are governments, when you, when you liquefy all the sector boundaries, what are governments actually doing? They're competing. They're competing with private sector, they're competing with other governments. In a globalized digital economy, you're competing for talent, you're competing for investment, but you're also competing for your citizens' attention. And I think that's really important because service design can be a competitive advantage in helping you guard that attention and then make sure your policy outcomes are enacted most effectively and engaging your citizens in the functioning of democracy. Right, policymakers are people too or policymakers or designers too. So service design really has come of age. I think what started as a niche idea in the 1980s is now the single biggest design discipline in the world, which means we have increasing bench strength of people entering the profession. And, and what it means is that the conversation on the importance of good design has matured. We are no longer having to explain things over and over again to a skeptical audience. And if you think about it, Technology use in the general population has matured, and yet even the crustiest of government decision makers have been exposed to good design and bad design in their everyday lives, and they have an intuitive emotional understanding of why it's important. And what this means is that there's an increasing recognition, I think, in a lot of the most forward-thinking government departments that service design cannot be seen as a tool to deliver policy outcomes. That's too slow. I think traditional model where you identify a policy need and then you deliver the need and you figure it out, you've got to have, it's too slow, you've got to have cross-functional teams that sit in the heart of the policy conversation. And what that means is we need to start making service design into a profession and creating new roles like policy designers and citizen interest representatives that sit on every single uh, policy conversation. And then the fi final point I'll make, and, and I'll end there, is treasure lies in the gap between the silos. What do I mean by this? W where are we going with all this? If we move away from services, through, if through the use of good service design, we can move away from services that are shaped like government departments. In fact, they're not just shaped like government departments, they're shaped like the bottlenecks inside government departments. And we can start creating services that are shaped like citizens then I think we've got the opportunity to talk about a holistic redesign of the entire machinery of government for something that is much better suited to shaping and to, to meeting citizen expectations in the future. And so my challenge really to all governments is, how are you going to use all of the great information that you've received today and actually drive it into your organizations? Not by saying, here's a good idea, use it if you want to, but why aren't you using the best ideas from around the world to reshape the relationship between the citizen and, and the state? And one of the things I would love to see is the first government that comes up with not just a director general, but a disruptor general to drive this. You know, get, we'll, we'll get a prize from me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for inviting me here today. Um, it's been a pleasure to come all the way from Australia to share this afternoon with you. Um, I'm going to uh, be talking about the Australian experience and a particular perspective on reimagining the public service in the face of global technology and public policy um, evolution 
that are transforming not only our economy, but also our society. I'm actually going to attempt to do this using the one slide you see on the screen now. So we're not going to flash through. There's a lot of words on there. I'm going to keep you focused. The slide, just to run through some of the, uh, the design of the slide, um, the slide's actually broken down into three columns talking about the supply side of disruption, the demand side of change to international behaviours, and then the governance response, and that is required to actually reconcile these in the design and delivery of services. The slide is also broken down to assist you and, and help me to explain, first, the wider national conversation that is occurring in Australia right now. But all in the lower section, I'm actually going to discuss the specific circumstances of my organisation that I lead within Australia, the Service Delivery Office, which is located in the Department of Finance. I'm also going to touch on the governance mechanisms that has actually made a successful delivery uh, mechanism within government, which is marrying and reconciling these two sides of supply and demand. So let's start. Uh, we're going to start in the, uh, the top uh, in the top row, and we're going to specifically look at the left-hand column labelled supply. Today you've heard from many presenters and they've confirmed that self-service, automation, conversational plat platforms are improving service quality and timeliness, but are challenging also the traditional workplace roles, skill sets, organisational structures by removing mundane tasks and augmenting creative roles. The workforce is changing at a similar rate with important implications for incentive mechanisms. As process gives way to problem solving, employees are increasingly seeking out purpose over more traditional incentives. If we move to the right column, labor demand, international social, demographic, economic, technological trends are driving expectations. And again, we've touched on many of these today. Citizens and governments expect simple and fast service at low cost through any channel at any time and with real transparency. The question is how do we approach this? The scale of change and increasing complexity can appear overwhelming. The lower section of the slide focuses on those supply and demand pressures applying concretely to my organisation and how an appropriate governance framework has helped us to actually reconcile these. Australia has three levels of government for a country that's only 20 something, uh, 20 something million, that was a bit short, 20 something million. Um, we have a federal, state and local governments. We're obviously a large sized country in terms of land mass. But at the federal level, there is over 180 individual agencies, government agencies working. Around 20% of the current operating expenditure of the Australian government, or about two billion a year, is actually relates to the provision of internal corporate services within these agencies. This doesn't include our um, defence arm, and it doesn't include our ICT expenditure. My, my organisation is uh, one of the six shared service hubs operating in the Australian government. We are rapidly modernising our service offering to deliver faster and better outcomes for our clients. And we're using initiatives that we've talked about here today, using evidence-based performance management and a heavy investment on automation and cloud and digital technologies. Through this effort, in one year, an in-year return on investment, the SDA was actually able to um, realise a 10% reduction in its operating costs. This included actually a single uh, reduction of 50% in one service offering. And this funding has actually been returned to the client agencies we serve to actually service the citizens in which they serve. These are our policy agencies. So what has driven this successful innovation, change and efficiency? The shared service program was established to enhance, standardise and achieve efficiency in the delivery of corporate services. The program creates a public sector market with six hub, hubs competing. We've divided our labour into different organisations. We're allowing agencies to focus on their core business in doing so. We're using price to enable agencies to directly compare offerings with internal costs and external providers. 
and we're leveraging fixed assets across a wider consumer base. So in conclusion, because my time is up, the application of market mechanisms can enable agility, innovation and efficiency in the public service context. I'm not suggesting that these mechanisms will work in all circumstances, and we've heard earlier about the importance of design. There will always be a different risk profile in the public service, privacy, security, profit motives, etc. We've talked about many of those today. There is risks, however, can be priced, but this may not be cost effective. We need to consider how market mechanisms can be used in our public sector to help drive innovation. At that point, thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, so today I want to talk about how necessity has driven national and savings and investment, an executive agency of the Treasury, um, to create a virtuous circle of innovation across government. Now in order to do that, I'm going to have to give you a bit of background on national savings and investment, and, uh, because I'm sure many of you don't know who we are or what we do, uh, and from here on in I'm going to refer to us as NSNI, and i because otherwise I'll take twice as long as uh, I need to, and nobody needs that this time of day. So, so NSNI and i was created by government in 1861 to provide a, a very admirable objective of giving the working man a place to save. And we carried on with this social remit for, for over 100 years. In the late 90s, we dropped the social remit and we got uh, an objective of delivering cost-effective financing. And what that means is we have to raise borrowing for government from the retail market and do it at a lower cost, uh, including interest costs, than they could do through the wholesale marketing guilts. And during that time, we've delivered savings of hundreds of millions of pounds to government uh, in reduced interest rate costs. Now we have 25 million customers, so we've got 40 million accounts who have invested 157 billion pounds with us. That makes us the fourth largest savings organisation in the UK, puts us up there with all of the big names, so your Lloyds, your Nationwide, your Santander's. And we have to compete with them to win customer investment to deliver that retail uh, borrowing. Um, now, uh, in recent times, we've faced a real challenge. We've seen the pace of change and development of financial services in the UK really accelerate up. And at the same time, there's been real pressure on budgeting governments uh, as we've had the austerity policy. And that created a real challenge for NSI. And, and it drove us to come up with an innovative solution of how we were going to meet this challenge. Um, we realised that this banking capability, this account capability and payment capability that we developed and honed in a competitive market could be reused across governments to deliver other services. And if we did that, we could get a contribution to our costs that means we could continue to invest in this capability. So, as a consequence of that, NSNI, Government Payment Services, was created. And we deliver services for all the big departments, HMRC, HMT, uh, Home Office, Department for Education, Ministry of Justice. And we deliver a, a variety of services that include big, important and critical policy deliveries, so like tax-free childcare, 30 hours free childcare, uh, help to save uh, equitable life payment schemes. We've worked with HMRC and Department for Education in partnership to deliver tax-free childcare and 30 hours, which were two individual policies as one service for parents and for childcare providers. So they apply once, they have one account to manage, it's a real customer-centric uh, service for them that hides all of the complexity of government in the background. We've also taken on existing services, so core funds office and uh, immigration and visa payment processing services. Our capability has allowed them to increase customer service, increase resilience and process and reduce operational cost. So for instance, core funds office, we were able to reduce their operating costs by 40%. And all of this has meant we've been able to deliver our objective. We got that contribution that allowed us to continue to invest in NSNI's capability uh, so we could continue to compete with banks and building societies. A really good example of this is that NSNI has embraced open banking. So we are letting our customers share their account data in the open banking ecosystem so they can benefit from all of those innovative and exciting ways the fintechs and many others are starting to use that to give them services. 
Now, all the big banks and building societies, they were forced to participate in open banking. Legislation was driven, so they were mandated to do so. NSNI voluntarily chose to participate. And that's because we saw the opportunity of being part of this innovative ecosystem. And of course, we're looking to share that with the rest of government. So we're working with them so they can look to uh, take advantage of this open banking capability. They can look to take advantage of our authorised and trusted and approved entry point into this ecosystem. And it's very early days for open banking for us, but it seems really exciting for government. You know, if you think of a, a department who has a, a service for a citizen and they can allow them to see that data in their banking app, so they can see it and interact with it much more frequently in an app that they're familiar with and comfortable. So, really exciting for us. So, in summary, I think is, in order to be able to continue to compete with banks and building societies in a really fast-changing financial services environment, we've had to leverage all of the capability we've developed, work with other government departments to help them to deliver those services, and that's meant we can continue to invest in exciting things like open banking, which again drives NS9 forward and enables, enables us to help other government departments to also benefit from it. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lee Heng from uh, Singapore. I'm uh, in, this, in this unit called the Public Service Division in the Prime Minister's Office. And in particular, we are called the Transformation Office. And in the next five minutes, I'll attempt to explain to you uh, the big picture of transformation down to one specific initiative on how we have innovated uh, in service delivery. So in my job in the Transformation Office, I'm often asked, why transform? And another way to ask this question is, uh, why does tomorrow needs working on? So in, the, in this slide, I listed three points. First one is about technological disruptions. Today, we have heard enough of that, how technology is much faster, developing much faster than before. Second point, about aging society. Singapore is an aging society very quickly. Uh, by 2030, we're going to have uh, people aged above 65. It's going to be one in four of our population. And lastly, growth of Asia. Singapore sits in uh, Southeast Asia. And we are a small country, and by definition, we have to take uh, follow the market forces. So we watch the growth of Asia very closely. And the fourth point on this slide is what we heard this morning from uh, our first speaker. He spoke, spoke about how his daughter asked him, uh, why is the registration of vehicle not as easy as buying uh, something, buying a pair of shoes online? So this point is really about rising citizen expectations. Uh, the second speaker spoke about the future citizens. But, and he explained these eight personas of the future citizen. But if you think about it, uh, in many cases, the future citizen is already today's citizen. And many of them has very high, have very high expectations of uh, government services. So what does this mean for the Singapore Public Service? So we have started the transformation movement uh, slight, uh, close to 20 years ago. Today we call this movement public sector transformation. It's really how we transform our public service so that we can be able to build that our future Singapore, and in terms of policies and programs, are all this fit for the future of the Singapore. One of the priorities of this transformation movement is about uh, uh, improving service delivery, and we have been doing so consistently in the last couple, uh, a decade or so. We have risen the risen baseline of service delivery in several ways. For example, uh, using simple language in our communications, the letters that we write to our citizens, uh, it has to be a simple way to communicate the ideas and decisions. <coughs> Second is about streamlining operation processes, about cutting down red tape. Third, addressing pain points. So what I wrote here is about no wrong door protocol. This is about how when uh, someone wants to go to a certain government department, he gets referred to another one and referred to another one. So this, is, this whole journey, user journey, is not good. So we have this protocol where uh, the first receiving department, he, he or the person or he or she will take care of the back end so that the citizen only deals with one point of contact in the government. And lastly, we have uh, improved our service delivery standards so that we respond faster to people and also move a lot of our services uh, online. But all this is not enough. Uh, we have to continually innovate in service delivery and as one, and uh, we call it one public service or one government. And we have a tagline here, unofficial tagline, high tech. And being high tech, it allows us to spend more time with our citizens and hence high touch. One stop, everything at one place, one portal and also one step, as few clicks as possible to get things done. And why do we do this? And Ratika spoke about it earlier before. 
she said, she used this phrase how uh, the government is competing with the private sector uh, for, uh, for attention. So we know that our citizens today, they demand fast and efficient services. So we are coming together to deliver seamless services, sometimes anticipatory, pushing things to the people before, uh, because we have data back end, so we know what they need at different points in time. And some are personalized uh, services to both our citizens and our businesses. So one specific example is what we call Moments of Life Initiative. It's about bringing together key services of the government during key moments of the uh, 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 citizen's life. So how we did this is uh, by first, we, we, we adopted a user-centric approach, design thinking. We spoke to citizens. We interviewed them over a year to find out what exactly uh, they need. And we did this for young families because we have identified this moment, uh, giving birth as one key moment of young families' life. And then we, at the back end, we transform our government services, organize ourselves differently to deliver services. And a product was to make the, uh, the government interaction, people's interactions with the government more uh, convenient and seamless. And the output, the product, uh, we did this with 15 government agencies. So as a result of that, um, the services, are at the, uh, information is at the person's fingertips. Uh, this tell me once, so they don't, everything is pre-filled. They only have to fill it one time. And we reduce the need to interact with multiple agencies and hence more convenient. So the output was this uh, Moments of Life uh, mobile app. Uh, it was launched in June last year, has been used about 20,000 times uh, by young families. So in this slide, we have a QR code. If you're interested, you can scan it and download it. Uh, it's really put information at the fingertips and to people when, when, whenever they need it, when they need it. So my last slide here is about how as a whole, Singapore Public Service is coming together to become a digital government. Last year, we launched a digital government blueprint. It's a short report with about 20 plus KPIs about how we intend to do this in a very systematic manner. So for example, all our, all our services will have 100% e-payment uh, options and also everything will be pre-filled with government data. So we have a tagline here, I'm not sure you can see it. Uh, Singapore government that is digital to the core and serves with the heart. So this means that we are committed to digitalizing, but that is not the that is not so not the sole purpose why we are doing it. It's really because we want to serve with the heart using technology as an enabler. Uh, come to the end of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, we have about twenty minutes. Um, I just want to ask one question. Um, so. We, We've heard all day about, you know, really quite radical approaches to changing how citizens receive services. Um, but I, I think if we had seen the kind of disruptive change that we've seen in the private sector, then <clears throat> we wouldn't be talking, you know, about, uh, for example, you know, improving procurement of the way that local authorities commission social care providers who then provide kind of batch services across a patch, we'd be talking about commissioning a service whereby individual people receiving social care could, you know, like Uber, choose, a, choose the particular care worker and you'd have a rating system. This is my, many of the digital transformations essentially in, in the private sector have been like, let's connect buyers and sellers with a rating system. So that would be taking it on another level. Um, do you think, should we be that ambitious at this point? Or is it, are we on a journey? And are, will we actually get, do you think, somewhere towards that kind of radical transformation about how, how we think about these things? Um, I'll throw it to Lucille if she's got her <laughs> thoughts. I've got a thought. Um, certainly we're starting to think about how you, not only do you deliver services for the mass, but how do you respond to the individual need? Uh, are we mature enough yet to deal with that in government? Uh, certainly in Australia, from an Australian perspective, not yet. Uh, but it's part of our journey and we recognise that uh, the private sector has already made some of that leap. The, the way we're thinking about how we do that is firstly is, is, is investing in the things we've been talking about today. But recognising at all times that we have to design services that actually meet people's expectations and needs, and they're going to continue to change as we take account of all these technologies. So, so yes, it's on the pathway, not there yet. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm just I'm wondering really, you know, just how much people should push so far, and, and is that the kind of future we might imagine? What do you think, Radhika? So the question is, how ambitious should governments be? And 
I think governments have a moral obligation to provide the best possible service to their citizens. And the best possible, the bar has moved significantly. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Uh, how about Dax? Sorry. Yeah, I think it's a good point, but I think I would say even in the private sector, it's only happened in, in, in certain specific areas. And some of the examples you talk about, you know, healthcare, social care, big thorny systemic issues to try to deal with there. So um, I think it absolutely should be the aspiration of government. I think it's tri driving to do it. I think it's looking for areas it can do it individually, and then we'll move to some of those bigger pieces. But, but you know, they are longer term objectives because there's fundamental issues to try to resolve just within the system before you talk about how you pre present and interact with it. Yeah, I mean, I choose it because it's an easy it's one. A good, it's because, a good example, yeah. Because yeah, it's, right. it's a service that people want to receive. Yeah, yeah, many yeah, many yeah. public services people don't necessarily want to receive yeah, them. And then yeah. you have another a whole set of issues. Peter. You asked, uh, are we ambitious enough? I think, uh, no, we are not. Um, perhaps the pace uh, at which we are um, seeing innovation in the, in the private sector uh, is now having as effects uh, on uh, the governments. Uh, we are rethinking our processes. We are reacting on developments. We are uh, responding to challenges. That's too much re. Uh, we should think about uh, our business model, but, sorry, but with care because it's not the task of the government to be the sparehead of innovation. Government, uh, and um, that was what I was aiming at when I talked about change management, they stand for reliability. They have to have people's trust, and you can't leave uh, the population behind uh, in all your ambition. Uh, so uh, be careful uh, how fast you go, but uh, try to think not out of the box, uh, but, uh, and this is the task of politicians and uh, the task of leadership, uh, to think of how we want to live together in the future and not uh, how uh, to uh, make something a bit faster, a bit more uh, uh, stress on time to market. And you see where Samsung got, what Samsung got, uh, exploding smartphones, and uh, we have fake news because people react on something they see on social media immediately and not checking if this might be true. Uh, so it's about quality against speed and reliability and trust uh, against haste. Uh, so be careful, but be ambitious by any way. I think for any organization to succeed, uh, whether it's private or public sector, we have to think networks. So uh, it means understanding what the user does, what the user needs, and then pushing to them, blurring the boundaries between the private and public sectors. So a concrete, concrete example will be WeChat uh, in China. If uh, you use the WeChat in China, you see that the app allows you to perform both government services and private sector services. For example, you can uh, reserve a hotel, you can pay government bills, you can pay your utility bills. So how they do that? So because they think networks. Uh, they, don't, they don't think about, this is my organization. I, I, I design my services around my organization. You design it around the citizens. Uh, for Singapore's case, uh, in the past couple of years, we have been emphasizing working as a whole of government, one public service. But recently, we think that's insufficient. We need to work whole of nation. And this means the public, the, pri the public sector reaching out to the private sector, co-creating with them, engaging them, and uh, in some cases, delivering the services together with them. Thank you. Questions? Questions? There's some hands somewhere. I see some movement down here. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Dimitri Gorf, uh, Tax and Customs uh, Policy, Ministry of Finance. Uh, I'd like to uh, link uh, uh, the thoughts of Radhika and Peter. Radhika, when you, we spoke, uh, and Peter, what you just said now. And I'm, uh, I'm wondering if I'm going to be uh, provocative in, in, in this. Uh, Radhika, I really liked your point about uh, countries and governments will be competing. And in fact, we do see that now. We've seen that uh, for quite some time for uh, corporations, mm -hmm. 
otherwise we wouldn't have the, the tax havens. Uh, we see that for citizens now, and we know that uh, four years ago, 2015, we had 1% of working population in the world as digital nomads who actually move around and, and it's very difficult for any country to claim they're resident in their country and that thus have to pay taxes. That number, of course, is now much bigger. And Peter, you now saying, you know, the government uh, don't have to be, uh, you know, uh, driving the innovation? Don't, don't have to be, uh, you know, up front there? I mean, uh, if, if that's truly the case and governments and countries will compete, then those who don't drive innovation in their countries will lose out. Those countries will lose out. Those governments will lose out. Don't you think that? I think that walking away from the government will disrupt any nation's uh, uh, coherence and uh, the common basis for the society. So, so this is key to start. Uh, I can't leave people behind, and we have digital gaps to deal with. Digital gaps that are massive. Men and women, old and young, uh, uh, rural areas and cities. Uh, uh, so it goes on and on. Uh, so being the spearhead of innovation and doing something agile, inno innovative, uh, I think we are getting a bit uh, too hysteric about these things. Uh, scrum, everybody does scrum nowadays. Uh, uh, it's decades old. It's a, a viable method, uh, a very good method, and it's uh, very good to have this. But you have the choice of many methods, and I don't want an agile surgeon uh, making a better operation uh, on my heart. And I'm not sure if you want to. It's about trust. I wouldn't do this. So what I'm saying is not that you have, and I think uh, I take up what you said, you have a moral obligation to deliver the best service for your citizens. But you can't go beyond that and say uh, it's not my, uh, uh, not my responsibility uh, how many citizens are sitting in a rural area and cannot use digital means. Uh, so if I remove the office uh, or uh, uh, the local uh, 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 store there, uh, then it's, uh, it's not my thing. So be careful where you go, be conscientious, but of course be ambitious. I repeat that and uh, I'll gladly join you if you say uh, you have to be as ambitious as possible, uh, but uh, don't lose the people you're responsible for, never. Anyone else want to comment on that balance between being disruptive can and I, carrying Can I jump in there just to be provocative, yeah. given it's the end of the day and you know we're going to have drinks hmm. later. Uh, l let me be provocative here. Um, I completely agree that you've got to bring everyone with you because you do serve everybody, not just the customers that you select. Um, and I, I completely agree that you need to be careful about how you bring technologies in um, and new mindsets and new thinking because a small change can have a massive impact on many, many people when you're a government in a way that doesn't always happen. However, there is a cost implication. Yeah not just to going too slow, too quickly, but also to going too slowly. Mm. And I think we need a very sophisticated dialogue, to your point, on what is the right pace of change. So I hear lots of, lots of conversations around autonomous cars. It's you know, a, a topic everyone likes to talk about. What would happen if, on one side, a car had to make a decision about killing five nuns versus you know, 12 children? How do you make that judgment call? Um, yes. <laughs> However, uh, the statistics around autonomous vehicles suggest that there is one, you know, a, a much, 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 much lower rate of deaths than human drivers. So every day that a policymaker does not make that choice, you've got thousands of people around the world who are dying because of human error. So what is the cost of going too slowly? on some of these choices, and also what is the cost of going too quickly on some of these choices. And there isn't a right answer to any of this. An engineer would tell you, let's stop talking about nuns and children, let's just make better breaks, you know, as the answer. Yeah. 
<laughs> all of these need to be considered uh, as part of a sophisticated conversation on the choices that we make, uh, because the choices we make right now really matter. I would say is, uh, no organisation or government really has a choice about the pace of change or disruption. You know, it's happening, it's being forced upon us. Citizens are demanding it, they're getting used to it. If we don't do it, private sector will step in. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's just happening. Now, there's choices within that of how you go. Uh, and I was really interested in your points about ethics. I think that's you know, a whole huge area when you get to algorithms and different things that I agree, government has to lead the way and, and really think through the outcomes and drivers and that and can't afford to have black boxes and, and, and take a back seat and just trust it. But we do not have a choice. You know, disruption change is coming. We've got to embrace it and get involved in it, direct it, but we've got to push forward with it. There isn't a really a static state, is there? I mean, in some cases, either you are either you're a disruptor or you, you, you're getting disrupted. disrupted. And Dimitri's a disruptor now. You've got him around. So we need to... <laughs> so it's going to happen. Uh, any, any hang? I just want to pick up on Peter's point about trust. So we often uh, can equate trust, to simplify it, trust is equals to being competent uh, and caring. So trust between the government and citizens, uh, you must show that you're both competent and caring, but often we fail to do either or fail to do both. So in the face of disruptions, uh, we can do that, we have the best services, but when people look at you, they feel that your services are much lagging behind to say the private sector or another country, they lose trust in you. And if you don't keep up, keep progressing and keep improving, you'll lose that trust over time and a lot of policies will fail because of that misplaced trust. Yourself? I think the point's been well covered, um, to be honest. <laughs> it has, it has. Fair enough. I mean, look, I, I, I've got 17 seconds. It's not enough, but I'm going to ask you all to answer in, in 25 seconds each. Oof. Okay. If you could introduce a single change, whatever, to regulations, structures, cultures, management, whatever, that would help drive innovation in service design and delivery, what would it be? Time's up. 20 <laughs> seconds, Peter. More leadership. Yeah. Three wow. seconds, fantastic. Tariqa. More leadership. Oh, <laughs> just because you took the good one, you have to find another one. <laughs> Uh, I would normalise pay scales between the public and the private sector. Normalise, equalise. Equalise, uh, remove the caps. Nice. Um, as a person whose background is all in data, I would use data a lot more than we're using it now. But we've had that beautiful conversation earlier today. It's the key there. Uh, I might use the 25 seconds. Uh, I, I would say break down the silos between departments and the structure of government because, you know, you touched that point, it leads to very unfocused solution is there are nothing to do with the citizen. And I even uh, lead into the point you made, which is those silos should be broken down between the private sector. You know, the, the way APIs and everything are working now is you, you've got to think systemic in how you tackle it. So yeah. just, just to build on Dex's point, uh, I would say to break down silos, you have to sub optimize at the individual level so that you optimize at the system level. So uh, for all different government departments or officers, it's really important to think system level and not just pursue optimization at your own agency, your own department. Thank you. We, we'll have a couple of minutes break and then we have 15 minutes with John Manzoni and then we have drinks. Nearly that. Meanwhile, thank you so much, guys. That was really good. making a better operation uh, on my heart. And I'm not sure if you want to. It's about trust. I wouldn't do this. So what I'm saying is not that you haven't, and I think uh, I take up what you said, you have a moral obligation to deliver the best service for your citizens. But you can't go beyond that and say uh, it's not my, uh, uh, not my responsibility uh, how many citizens are sitting in a rural area and cannot use digital means. Uh, so if I remove the office uh, or uh, 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 the local uh, 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 store there, uh, then it's, uh, it's not my thing. So be careful where you go, be conscientious, but of course be ambitious. I repeat that and uh, I'll gladly join you if you say uh, you have to be as ambitious as possible, uh, but uh, don't lose the people you're responsible for, never.
Anyone else want to comment on that balance between being disruptive can and I, carrying Can I jump everybody? in there just to Certainly. be provocative? Yeah. Given it's the end of the day and, you know, we're going to have drinks hmm. later. Uh, <laughs> l let me be provocative here. Um, I completely agree that you've got to bring everyone with you because you do serve everybody, not just the customers that you select. Um, and I, I completely agree that you need to be careful about how you bring technologies in. Um, and new mindsets and new thinking because a small change can have a massive impact on many, many people when you're a government in a way that doesn't always happen. However, there is a cost implication, yeah. not just to going too, slow, too quickly, but also to going too slowly. Mm. And I think we need a very sophisticated dialogue, to your point, on what is the right pace of change. So I hear lots of Lots of conversations around autonomous cars. It's you know, a, a topic everyone likes to talk about. What would happen if on one side a car had to make a decision about killing five nuns versus you know, 12 children? How do you make that judgment call? Um, yes. <laughs> However, uh, the statistics around autonomous vehicles suggest that there is one, you know, a, a much, 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 much lower rate of deaths than human drivers. So every day that a policymaker does not make that choice, you've got thousands of people around the world who are dying because of human error. So what is the cost of going too slowly on some of these choices? And also, what is the cost of going too quickly on some of these choices? And there isn't a right answer to any of this. An engineer would tell you, let's stop talking about nuns and children, let's just have, make better breaks. You know, as the answer, <laughs> all of these need to be considered uh, as part of a sophisticated conversation on the choices that we make, uh, because the choices we make right now really matter. I would say is, uh, no organisation or government really has a choice about the pace of change or disruption. Now. You know, it's happening, it's being forced upon us, citizens are demanding it, they're getting used to it. If we don't do it, private sector will step in. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's just happening. Now, there's choices within that of how you go. Uh, and I was really interested in your points about ethics. I think that's you know, a whole huge area when you get to algorithms and different things that I agree, government has to lead the way and, and really think through the outcomes and drivers of that and can't afford to have black boxes and, and, and take a back seat and just trust it. But we do not have a choice. You know, disruption change is coming. We've got to embrace it and get involved in it, direct it, but we've got to push forward with it. There isn't a really a static state, is there? I mean, in some cases, either you are either you're a disruptor or you, you you're getting disrupted. disrupted. And Dimitri's a disruptor. Now you've got him around, so we need to. <laughs> so it's going to happen. Uh, any, any hang? Comments? I just want to pick up on Peter's point about trust. So we often uh, can equate trust to simplify it. Trust is equals to being competent uh, and caring. So trust between the government and citizens. Uh, you must show that you're both competent and caring, but often we fail to do either or fail to do both. So in the face of disruptions, uh, we can do that we have the best services, but when people look at you, they feel that your services are much lagging behind, the, say, the private sector or another country, they lose trust in you. And if you don't keep up, keep progressing and keep improving, you'll lose that trust over time and a lot of policies will fail because of that misplaced trust. Yourself? I think the point's been well covered, um, to be honest. <laughs> it has. It has. Fair enough. I mean, look, I, I, I've got 17 seconds. It's not enough, but I'm going to ask you all to answer in, in 25 seconds each. Oof. Okay. If you could introduce a single change, whatever, to regulations, structures, cultures, management, whatever, that would help drive innovation in service design and delivery, what would it be? Time's up. 20 <laughs> seconds, Peter. More leadership. Yeah. Three wow. seconds, fantastic. Yeah. More leadership. Oh, <laughs> just because you took the good one, you have to find another one. <laughs> uh, I would normalise pay scales between the public and the private sector. Normalise, equalise. Equalise, uh, remove the caps. Nice. Um, as a person whose background is all in data, I would use data a lot more than we're using it now. But we've had that beautiful conversation earlier today. It's the key there. Uh, I might use the 25 seconds. Uh, I, I would say break down the silos between departments and the structure of government because, you know, you touched that point. It leads to very unfocused solution is there are nothing to do with the citizen. And I even uh, lead into the point you made, which is 
those silos should be broken down between the private sector. You know, the, the way APIs and everything are working now is you, you've got to think systemic in the, how you tackle it. So just, just to build on Dex's point, uh, I would say to break down silos, you have to sub-optimize at the individual level so that you optimize at the system level. So uh, for all different government departments, it's all the offices, it's really important to think system level and not just pursue optimization at your own agency, your own department. Thank you.